From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Taking on a Kennedy and Kennedy country is no easy task, but Republican Sean Bilot is used to running up against big names in politics. He ran a strong but unsuccessful bid to upset veteran Congressman Barney Frank in 2010. Bilot is trying again, challenging a young Joe Kennedy to represent southeastern Massachusetts in Congress. This week on the first half of Newsmakers, candidate for Massachusetts' fourth congressional seat, Republican Sean Bilot. Then, putting the magnifying glass over the 38 studio scandal. Should state legislators hold hearings about the deals leading up to the epic collapse of Kurt Schilling's video game company? The taxpayer-backed loan that lured the startup from Massachusetts could cost taxpayers $100 million. Our guest on the second half of Newsmakers has called for action on Smith Hill, Republican State Senator Dawson Hodgson. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, my colleague, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Eyewitness News analyst Arlene Violet. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Sean, good to have you back. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. It's been a couple of years. We yeah. had you uh, here in 2010. Um, I do want to point out to our viewers that we did invite uh, Joe Kennedy to this program, and we did not hear back from him. Uh, Sean, I want to start with this question. I was just doing some research on you again sure. before you came on, and I, I stumbled across upon an Esquire magazine article and they called you I didn't a, know I was in there like Scott Brown <laughs> I, I think it was I, I should say it should have been a uh, a blog okay. uh, but uh, they referred to you as a Tea Party Republican do you agree or disagree with that you know that's interesting I heard a lot of that in 2010 because that was all the rage then to say any Republican was Tea Party um, you know sure there's there's crossover right uh, we believe in fiscal discipline that's something I talk a lot about uh, what else that means, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't say I identify myself with it as a Tea Party Republican any more than I would say I, I identify myself as a, you know, um, RNC Republican or a, you know, I'm a Sean Bielat Repo Republican, which means I look at issues, I try to take the most uh, pragmatic course forward, and I'm very clear in, uh, based on my philosophies, how I will vote on things. Let, let's take a, one issue that is uh, near and dear to people uh, along the South Coast. Um, you have said that you're against earmarks, so how would you vote on and fund the South Coast Rail Project sure. that some say would be an economic boon to that region? Right. Well, when I say earmark, I mean uh, the definition of earmark being funds that wouldn't be appropriated if not asked for specifically on behalf of a, a congressman or a district, right? So uh, transportation funds are appropriated every year. It is my role in Congress to try to get those funds for Massachusetts for the 4th District. That's appropriate. What I wouldn't do is say, you know, we want to fund a senior center in this particular town or name a bridge here for somebody. Those are the kinds of earmarks that pervert the process. What if the way to fund this is it was, and I think what you're saying is if the earmark is attached to a bill that has nothing to do with, uh, you know. That, right, So right. What, what if it was, well, push comes to shove, this is hugely important to your constituents, and that's the way that it was going to get funded, an earmark that's attached to a bill that may not no, have I don't, much. I, I don't believe in that, but I do believe you that would, we can you, go through uh, the traditional. But to be clear, you would turn down that funding for the South Coast. I wouldn't pursue it, so I doubt it would be in there absent me pursuing it. Right. Okay. So I would go through the traditional and appropriate appropriations process for transportation infrastructure. I believe it's a, a rightful role of the federal government to provide that. I think that this has interstate commerce potential because of its proximity to Rhode Island, and I do think it would be a boon to the region. Additionally, um, short sea shipping, uh, we have a deep water port there which would allow for that. That's also an interstate commerce issue. Federal government has a clear role in regulating and enabling interstate com commerce, and so I'd be happy to try to get funds for it. Well, Mr. Bielet, you're 37, Joe Kennedy's 32, uh, only about five years apart. You both earned degrees at Harvard. You served in the military. He served in the Peace Corps. You've never held elected office, to my knowledge. No. He's never held elected Correct. office. Um, your supporters mock Kennedy's youth and inexperience, as Ronald Reagan put it, but your profile doesn't sound that. But he was talking about somebody older. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I know, but and I'm so. saying, you're, you know, it, you, you don't sound that different. It's not like you come with, well, I've been, I've been running this or that for X number of years. You know, so what, you know, what, what is the big distinction you see sure. here when you're pretty close to your same generation, really? Well, it's interesting the choices we've made and, and uh, how much more experience I have, given that we're not that far apart in age. Uh, so I had four years on active duty as a Marine officer. I've spent uh, 10 years in the Reserve, but in addition, for most the past decade, I've been working in various types of businesses. I've worked as a management consultant for very large uh, corporations, helping them with growth and strategy and market entry. 
I've worked, uh, I've managed a $100 million product line of defense robots that are used to go after roadside bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've consulted to small companies and now I'm running an online startup. The theme here is I've seen how a lot of businesses work. I have some ideas of what works and what doesn't, what government should do and not do, what impedes the progress and growth of companies. And it's about knowing what the right question to ask when, you, when you're looking at problems. It's not about having all the answers, nobody does, but it is about ha knowing what to ask, how to listen, how to respond to businesses, what government It sounds like it primarily then comes down to whether or not you've spent time in the private sector. I think that's, that's extremely important at a time where jobs in the economy are the number one issue we face as a country and as a state and as a district, to have people in Washington who have worked in the economy and grown jobs and created them. But do you think the Peace Corps and, and being a prosecutor, that, that's not serious experience? I don't make a judgment as to whether or not it's serious, but I would say that anyone else with two and a half years work experience would not be considered a serious candidate. If the name Kennedy weren't there, if the ability to raise $4 million weren't there, nobody would be taking uh, him, sim him seriously as a candidate based on his experience. Did you go from uh, the frying pan into the fire from having Bonnie Frank as your prior opponent and now having Kennedy? It's a very different race. Uh, redistricting has changed the basic odds in the district, uh, made it much more balanced. Um, Barney Frank was extremely qualified. As much as I disagreed with him, he had... You didn't sound like you thought so in 2010. <laughs> well, I never said his ideas were good, but his, <laughs> his base of experience, his resume for the job... He was qualified job. to pursue his terrible ideas. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And he knew how to defend them and how to pursue them and how to defend his record. I disagreed with almost all of it, but at least he could do that. Whereas with Kennedy, you don't have experience, you don't have a willingness to move away from the traditional Democratic talking points, and you don't have a willingness to get out in front of the public on TV or radio in front, or in front of crowds and say, here's why I'm qualified, here's why I should get this office. How many times has he uh, turned down appearances with you? Uh, 21 times. Uh, I've, by my count. This is me going on different shows, radio or TV, and that people saying, invited, like that's today. right, like today, where he has said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. I've had 15 town halls that are open to the public. He sent a uh, video person to every single one of them. He has had zero. We agreed to 16 debates. He grudgingly accepted three that were sorted debates, and then uh, recently one more after the Boston Globe editorial page went after him. They're not usually the friends of Republicans, so for them to say this guy ought to be getting out there, that tells you something. Um, Sean, entitlement reform is one of those phrases that's becoming almost a, a household phrase now sure. because of this, uh, the national campaign. Um, and for Republicans, a, a good litmus test often for people, or one that's often used, I should say, is, is p the Paul Ryan approach to Medicare. Sure. He's uh, proposed a premium support program. Others call it a voucher uh, program. Do you think it's a good idea? In, in ways to it's a great starting point, and he has even said the same. He said, look, I know that this isn't a complete answer. This is a starting point, and if you read the Ryan plan, it's, it's pretty uh, conceptual in nature. It's not very specific, and I only did that recently because I was accused repeatedly of embracing every aspect of the Ryan plan, Sean Bielet, Paul Ryan, same thing. What don't you like of the Ryan plan? It's 100 pages. There's plenty in there not to like. Cutting Pell Grants is not to like. Uh, the Medicare solution isn't perfect, but here's the thing. You have to have an opposite view. You have to have another set of ideas. It's not enough to say, that's awful, and use scare tactics and put up the ads that he's running about me saying, Sean Bielat wants to cut Medicare and privatize Social Security and the rest of it. That's not true, first of all. It's not an accurate uh, representation of my views. But in the second point, even if it were, you have to engage. You have to present another set of policies. It's not enough to just throw bombs. That's not good policy. It may be good politics, not good policy, and it's why we're at the point where we are with but the House today. is a majoritarian institution, and you face the same challenge as most Republicans in the Northeast, which is that the national GOP is not really in step with a majority of voters, so you can see it in where the presidential races go. You know, if you got down there, isn't the most important you cast the one that makes John Boehner Speaker of the House, or perhaps Eric Cantor, a different Republican? Or, or whomever, right? So I don't know who but the not, candidates not are likely Nancy to be. Pelosi, not well, Steny it's Hoyer. unlikely that I would vote for Nancy Pelosi for Speaker. Would, you, right? Hoyer? Hoyer? would you vote for John Boehner? I would. Uh, I, I, you know, it'll depend on what's, who the candidates are. Um, I would say this, though. For me, it's a lot less about uh, how the Republican Party is run and who's running it and the ideas coming down. Every day I get in my email um, talking points from the NRCC. I never open them. I dispose of them uh, because I can come up with my own talking points based on my own ideas, many of which 
align with the Republican Party. That's why I'm a Republican. Well, let me ask you another one. But many of which I don't want us to run short of time. Bush tax cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, the big dividing line right now is $250,000. Do you think they should be extended for everyone, just people under two fifty? dollars where, where do you stand on that? Down economy is the wrong time to raise taxes on anyone. Taking money out of the economy is not what we need to do when we need to grow as a country. If over the longer term we want to reach some sort of compromise solution to uh, eliminate the deficit, I think we should consider all sorts You're of options. You're open to it, but yeah. not now. Your um, website says you support a flat tax. I uh, do. Absolutely no exemptions, no deductions, just a flat tax? Well, it, really, it's a theoretical exercise because that's not going to happen. But yes, in theory, uh, an absolutely flat tax. In practice, what we can do is have a flatter tax and keep some of the very popular deductions, such as the mortgage interest. Deduction. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose, though? Even no, Kane in his 999 didn't go into those exemptions. But it, right, so I'm saying we're more likely to keep them, I think is, is what you're saying. But yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely, it would serve a purpose. Flatter will create some of that. We have a bunch of uh, strange actions, unintended consequences as a result of the current code. Corporations, individuals making decisions they otherwise wouldn't. And there's a hidden cost to this inefficiency, which is all the tax accountants and tax attorneys that companies are hiring to avoid things. And that's capital that could have been employed uh, better, more efficiently, and created better outcomes had it not been directed that way. Um, you have called for the repeal of the National Health Care Reform Act or, or, or Obamacare. Um, should it, all of it be thrown out, or are there elements of it that you would like to see preserved? Well, I don't think you can do a piece in part. Um, when you have a bill that's as complex and interrelated as this bill is, I don't think you can just change a part here or a part there. If you take one thing out, how do you pay for the other thing? I think we have to repeal the entire document, the entire piece of legislation, and replace it with solutions that make sense, which is, and things that are properly within the purview of the federal government, such as uh, enabling interstate com competition between healthcare providers and insurers. Competition will uh, spread coverage, drive down costs, do a lot of what we want it to do. If we go first for market-based solutions, once we do as much as we possibly can with the market, in terms of reducing costs, extending coverage, et cetera, that's when you get the government involved. You don't start by doing that simply because you get inefficiencies. You get the economic outcomes that you weren't at first anticipating. There, there, was, there are some ultra popular provisions um, in, in, that, uh, in that act, including allowing children to stay on their parents' insurance until 26 and not denying coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. You're saying toss those out. I'm saying in a competitive market, you would find plans that would offer those things. Um, we're not at that point, obviously. Uh, those are popular provisions. It's unlikely. I mean, you also have to, I'm a pragmatist, right? You're not going to, like, I would like a flat tax. We're not going to get there politically. So wh where can we get? If we have to keep those provisions in order to get a solution that we can all agree to, I'd be more than happy to, to, to vote for that. Um, I, think it's, I think the problem we get is when people are too dogmatic and you send people down who are solely towing the party line, then you're not going to get compromise. Everybody says they want compromise and then vote for people who are telling you straight up that they're not going to compromise. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, referencing uh, dogmatic, uh, you list as a credential that you're a Knights of Columbus mm -hmm. uh, member on your website. Uh, to what degree does your belonging to that organization affect your stance on abortion and gay marriage? I wouldn't say at all. Uh, I would say my Catholic faith does, though. Um, I am pro-life. Uh, I think though we're at a time where most people, the social issues that matter are jobs. You know, if you don't have a job, if you're not sure how you're paying the rent and, and feeding the kids, these other issues matter a lot less. Pro-life in the sense of uh, the Republican platform then that says no abortions, period, without even the exception of rape and incest? I would like to see the number of abortions reduced. There's broad consensus around that. Eighty percent of Americans would like to see fewer people uh, have abortions, fewer abortions performed. Eighty percent of Americans don't want to see public funding. 80% of parents believe in, er, of Americans believe in parental notification. There are areas of broad consensus. That you support? Yes. And gay marriage? Um, civil unions, the, the ability to, to divide and hold property and make decisions about legal arrangements, I think should be left to individuals. I mean, I, whether they're gay, straight, related, not related, I, I, don't have an, I don't see why the government needs to be involved in how people allocate uh, property and, and rights. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke has a new quantitative easing program uh, to, uh, to ease monetary policy, very controversial among Republicans. Where do you stand on uh, that decision? Again, I don't think this is a straightforward, you know, an easy thing to answer, right? I think there will be some beneficial effects. I'm skeptical of the idea that uh, increasing the rate of inflation is ultimately good for us long term by decreasing the value of debt. It's going to hit seniors really hard and others on fixed incomes, among other things. Uh, so I think it isn't, it isn't a clear yes or no. I probably wouldn't have gone that direction, 
but but you're also there. not an adamantly anti-Fed. Uh, so some people no. we've heard on this show this year yeah, are very, I do. very opposed to the Fed's moves. Yes, yeah, some people are um, into the audit the Fed uh, movement. I have never heard a good reason not to do that, mm -hmm. so I would support that. I've, I'm waiting. If somebody out there had, can tell me why we shouldn't do that, I'm perfectly open to hearing. I just haven't heard it yet. Um, so that seems like you know something we ought to do and have a better understanding of how the Fed's making its decisions, why, and whether the Correct. We're going to have to go to a break pretty soon, uh, so I just want to cover some quick ground here with about a minute left. Um, and you said you don't want to give a yes or no, but I'm going to ask you some yes or no questions. How do you like that? Um, yes or no, uh, term limits for uh, members of uh, Congress? And no, I'm concerned it would push too much power to unelected officials on the staffs. So no one? No, but I'd like comprehensive campaign finance reform, which allows constituents to impose term limits more easily. And Rhode Island just passed a voter ID law. I don't know if you're aware of that. It requires people to show identi identification of vote. Do you think that's a good idea? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think if the issue is people not affording that ID, then the state should find ways to provide it for free. But the I answer shouldn't be, oh, let's not identify anybody. Uh, fraud is fraud. And finally, uh, letter grade, if you could. What letter grade A through F would you give President Barack Obama? A D minus. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say an F, but uh, pretty close. I mean, we have seen an awful incoherent foreign policy. We have seen almost no real economic growth. Yes, there is some marginal growth. Uh, we've seen uh, an end run around Congress through executive orders. Oh, if Congress doesn't do this, I'll get it done. Well, that's not how the Constitution works. Got to um, ask then. D minus for President Obama. What about President Bush? Uh, D. See? I mean, he was. You don't like anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm an equal opportunity um, criticizer, you know, a critic. Um, I, I think, you know, or we shouldn't have been in Iraq. That should have never happened. I said in 2002 and believe now we should have been focused on Iran, which had clear intent and was already on path to uh, developing a nuclear program. Had we focused on them and I'm not say military action, but I'm saying potential military action, we wouldn't be in the place we are today. Um, I thought that that was, you know, a horrible decision. Medicare Part D, well, very popular and, and providing benefit was something we couldn't afford. Um, you know, there were a number of things that happened under that administration. And what about a letter grade for House Speaker John Boehner? <laughs> That's tough because he's had such a tough caucus to work, work with. You How know, so? uh, well, many of the people who came in during the last election have been very um, adamant in not giving ground, in, in not reaching compromise. He's had to try to manage that, and I think it's a tough hand to be dealt, frankly. So uh, that grade is what? Good, thank you, <laughs> yes. Up in the air to be evaluated. Oh, come on. Uh, John, uh, we'll incomplete. Say, I'll give him a B on that one. All right. <laughs> Republican for Congress in the 4th District, Sean Bilot. Thank you, 4th uh, Di District of Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us. Thank when you we come back. If only we had four districts. <laughs> <laughs> right. we, we might only have one in 10 years. Who knows? Uh, when we come back, the 38 Studios can scandal, we're going to be speaking with someone who's been calling for hearings at the State House on this. That's State Senator Dawson Hodgson. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, I'm joined by WPRI.com's Ted Nisi and Eyewitness News Analyst Arlene Violet. Our guest for the second half, State Senator Dawson Hodgson. Dawson, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You've been uh, the most vocal advocate on Smith Hill over the, uh, the, the, the need for hearings on the 38 Studio scandal. But before we get into that, I want to ask you uh, and, and have you weigh in on an outstanding question regarding that, the 38 Studios bond. House Speaker Gordon Fox, former Governor Don Kachiri, both have said on this program that they think the state should explore the possibility of not paying back the $100 million loan, defaulting on it. What do you say? It would be irresponsible not to explore that possibility. Um, I'll tell you right now, as a legislator who's going to be called on to vote in appropriation of that money, I need to be convinced that it's in the best interest to the taxpayer. I'm going to maintain my fiduciary to, uh, obligation to my constituents and the whole state. Um, I, I see... Um, Those two are in conflict, though. The, if, if you were to listen to Rosemary Booth Gologli or, uh, or the general treasurer, they say not paying these back uh, could hurt us in, in trying to get further bonds, and it could lower our bond rating um, but, you know, with the, the ratings agencies. Well, I, I've, been, I've been asking uh, the executive, the legislative, and the treasury uh, all for answers uh, for those predictions. I want to know um, what will be the consequences to our constituents and our, uh, our uh, credit rating Have you got if, an answer? if we defaulted. I haven't. Um, you know, I, I've heard the same blanket statements that, uh, that, that we must uh, honor these bonds, um, and I certainly trust the financial acumen of, uh, of the treasurer and, um, and Ms. Gologli. Um, 
but I've also heard compelling analysis that um, were we not to pay the moral obligation bonds, um, that would essentially take us out of the moral obligation business, um, that, the, that credit ratings for moral obligations from the state would no longer be uh, uh, financially feasible for, for the state to use it as a tool. Um, and that's a consideration. But I haven't heard a compelling case how this would affect our credit rating for general, uh, for revenue bonds and general obligation bonds. Um, you know, general, that's backed by our full faith and credit. That is legally enforceable. Um, the, the moral obligation tool that was created by Governor Rockefeller in New York back in the 60s as a way to bypass his legislature and uh, really became popular as a way to, sorry, not bypass his legislature, uh, bypass voters', the voters, 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 uh, voters um, yeah. of voters' approval. Um, you know, maybe we need voter approval for these projects, um, particularly when we look at the results of, of, of some of these actions. And they're higher risk. Uh, they are. You do pay a premium. I believe it's a full half letter grade, uh, uh, half grade below when you buy them. Um, and interest rates, I think, six and seven percent. Mm -hmm. And I've heard various descriptions of who bought these bonds. Um, and I haven't been able to find that out or what they're trading. But if um, you know, if people are paying, a, um, if they're not doing their diligence any better than our EDC uh, leadership or our legislative leadership. Um, you know, there's a lot of irresponsibility going around. I'm not going to let my constituents pay the full mm -hmm. price. Senator, you've been beating the drum for months, as Tim said, uh, to hold oversight hearings in the Assembly on what happened with 38 Studios, what went wrong. Strong resistance from uh, the Democratic leadership and Senator Sheehan. And uh, they, in part, say that the law enforcement agencies have told them not to do this. Tim and I went to the state police this week and asked, and they said, they acknowledged, the state police have told state lawmakers it could interfere with the investigation. Shouldn't you be listening to the state police as well? Um, if, a, if there was a legitimate effort to pursue a legislative inquiry, um, I have no doubt that the Attorney General, um, or before this they were using the U.S. Attorney as their uh, straw man, the U.S. Attorney could pick up the phone and, uh, and tell the Acting Chairman, uh, witnesses A, B, and C, um, we, we don't want to be made available for your hearing. How valuable uh, would that hearing be then if they're important witnesses to getting to the bottom of what happened? I certainly think that there are avenues to get these people in front of, uh, in front of uh, hearings, um, in front of the public so that the, the uh, general public can identify who the players are. Um, listen, there, there's always a bit of theater with these things. Um, when, you know, I've talked about Solyndra, that's a similar uh, federal uh, loan guarantee scandal, and uh, when that company defaulted, within three weeks the executives were in front of a congressional oversight committee. Now, what they did there, they didn't give any answers. They, uh, they invoked their Fifth Amendment rights. Um, but a lot of the people who you may uh, assume had some responsibility for this deal, um, you know, give them the opportunity to tell their story. And uh, if they want to exercise their Fifth Amendment rights, um, it's a very important protection we have. We should protect their, uh, their give their, them all due uh, process in criminal matters. But this is an entirely separate focus. This is answers for the people. What answers? Are, what are we looking for an answer to at this point? We know what, we know what happened. We know that where the votes happened. We know Speaker Fox has acknowledged that meetings took place, et cetera. What are we waiting to find out? Well, I think you need to know, uh, I think we need to know, and the voters need to know um, who in the legislative and executive branches uh, uh, was involved in specifically tailoring this loan guarantee program to, to meet the needs of 38 studios. Um, you know, I've, I really know, Ted, uh, in terms of factual basis for this, what I've read from your reporting and other members of the press. Um, you know, there, there has to be a, a, an official forum for answers to come out. The Attorney General and the, uh, and the U.S. Attorney, their job is to prosecute and obtain convictions for violations of the criminal code, not to expose process or deficiencies in judgment. And the, the citizens of the state have an opportunity once every two years to, to, to weigh in in a substantive way um, on how their government's going. And you know, this, is, this is clearly a failure. And, um, it's a failure that apparently nobody's responsible for in the legislature or elected office. Yeah, this argument about true. interfering with the criminal processes was the exact argument for the RISDIC uh, commission investigation. And finally, they came around and did the uh, a commission investigation of RISDIC. But uh, isn't it going to become academic now? You asked for this before the election started. If it happens after the election and early on, won't people forget the responsibility issue of who got us into this mess? Oh, sure. And it has the potential to become just a, a a show. I um, and I, I read some of the old journal stories about the uh, the uh, Tights Commission uh, looking at yes. uh, at RISDIC, and uh, RISDIC for those who don't know that was the the bank the post credit union yes. crisis. And um, and they ultimately had a, uh, had hearings with over 50 hours of, of testimony, uh, and a lot of high profile individuals, legislators, people connected 
insiders, uh, how were they described in the journal back then, came and had to describe, you know, what, how, how are they touched by this? Um, and what struck me when I was reading this copy of the paper uh, from, uh, from back About then 30 seconds, was a, a description from a member of the general public who had been in the gallery saying, this was just a show trial. And that's what we'll have after this election. Um, if we do have hearings after the election is decided with the new General Assembly in place, I won't have confidence in their findings unless it is done in a bipartisan manner that, uh, that, uh, that the uh, minority and majority parties have equal representation and freedom to pursue a, a, a wide-ranging inquiry how we got into this situation. Uh, less than 15 seconds really to talk. Uh, our poll shows the vast majority of registered voters disapprove of how Governor Chafee's handled uh, 38 studios. Do you agree with that? I don't have enough information to, to, uh, to judge. I, I've heard the criticisms um, that, uh, that he could have kept closer tabs on it. He should have. Certainly the Senate Oversight Committee tasked with monitoring quasi We have to let you go. Thank you very much, State Senator Dawson Hodgson, for joining us. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. How long, how long was that?